You're listening to a new episode of The Brave Technologist. This one features Garrett, who's been on chain since 2014. He joined Current Finance in 2020, helping to shape the decentralized protocol powering DeFi stablecoin and crypto markets by enabling high-yield on-chain savings, protected borrowing, and low swippage flops on EVM chains. A startup founder with deep AI roots, Garrett launched the first AI-powered resume grader back in 2008. He taught courses at the University of Washington on AI, blockchain, and financial technology, and holds an MBA from MIT. We recorded this episode with Garrett live at the Rare Evo Summit in Las Vegas. And in this episode, we discussed the significance of the Genius Act in transforming stablecoin landscape, how regulatory clarity has spurred the growth of TradFoy stablecoins, and why their success often ties to their integration within the DeFi ecosystem, the inherent risks and rewards associated with DeFi stablecoins and the resilience of these digital assets, along with the vital role that platforms like Curve play in providing liquidity and stability in the market. And now for the early subscribe episode of The Brave Technologist. Garrett, welcome to The Brave Technologist. How are you doing today? Doing fantastic, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming. I've been excited to have this conversation. We're here at Rare Evo. Uh, you're doing a keynote here on why TradFi stablecoins need DeFi stablecoins. Can you give us a kind of a preview or dig into a little bit of that around that core message? Absolutely. So since the passage of the Genius Act, and even before that, we've seen that centralized stablecoins have already been undergoing a pre-Cambrian explosion. Uh -huh. We are seeing billions upon billions of dollars from the traditional financial system coming on chain through TradFi stablecoins. There's also this other subset of DeFi stablecoins which stand to benefit from this indirectly. And what's really interesting is that the biggest TradFi stablecoins, the one whether they launched 10 years ago or whether they're just launching now, now that there's regulatory clarity, the ones that have seen the greatest success are those that have leaned the heaviest into the DeFi ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So it's entirely a fantastic strategy to try bootstrapping liquidity via DeFi stablecoins, partly because of actually the way that the Genius Act was written. Okay, cool. Why do you think this conversation really matters right now in the evolution of stablecoins and financial system? So we've never seen an act like the Genius Act get passed. For about the past 10, 15 years, the United States has been incredibly hostile towards cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. The only centralized stable coins that were able to come into existence were those like Tether that existed sort of offshore in this legal gray area. But there was such insane product market fit for stable coins mm -hmm. and such demand for US dollar denominated stable coins that Tether grew to become systemically important sized. Meanwhile, the rest of the world, especially companies here in the United States, were watching jealously, Tether being the most profitable company in the world per employee, and they wanted to get a piece of this. Now that the Genius Act has passed, there is a insanely good pathway for anybody. Brave could launch a stablecoin and have it be backed and supported by the government if they decide to go through this Genius Act provision and launch a regulatory friendly, compliant stablecoin. What, what do people often misunderstand in the differences between TradFi and DeFi stablecoin? I'd like to kind of like have the audience get a better understanding of the differences between a TradFi and a DeFi stablecoin. So the risk profiles are vastly different. Uh -huh. And they, of course, like all investments are risky. And of course, as we've said a million times, nothing in this is financial advice, right? Right, right, totally. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but that being said, within DeFi, you have much greater smart contract risk. Okay. Just to name one, there's thousands of risks. There could be rug risk. You might be a hostile person that's just sitting there like trying to pull the rug out from someone and steal all the money. There could be collateral risks in DeFi stable coins because oftentimes they're backed by volatile currencies. Okay. So there's a million things that can go wrong. The smart contract risk is like a really big one because mm -hmm. even if you have a great team and they've built a fantastic stable coin solution, there's just one tiny bug in an immutably deployed smart contract. All the money can be drained. Yeah laundered to North Korea and just disappeared and they have no hope of getting it back. Are they collateralized differently, the DeFi stablecoins compared to the TradFi ones? Yes, usually with TradFi stablecoins, I hand you a dollar, you take that dollar, put it in the bank, and you send me a stablecoin. Uh -huh. So if there's somehow like a smart contract bug in the stablecoin that you sent me, it doesn't matter because you still have the dollar. Okay. So pound for pound, like dollar backed you know, centralized stablecoins tend to be very safe. Now they still have different risk factors. Sure. There could be bank runs that mm -hmm. can undermine the traditional financial system. The US might decide to default on its debt payments and 
you know, U.S. banking system could collapse overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have all the risks of being exposed to the U.S. banking system. Mm -hmm. You might go to a like North Korean street vendor and buy some gimbap and have your you know, currency frozen because transacting with a foreign nation. Right, 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 right. right. <laughs> so there are still like risks with both forms of stable coins. But generally speaking, one of the cardinal rules of DeFi is that the risk and reward are insanely correlated. Yeah. So this means that, like, for example, the risk-free treasury rate is maybe like 3.5%. That's what you can get in a bank buying T-bills. That's generally the cap, the rewards you might see with a TradFi stablecoin. Okay, okay. With DeFi stablecoins, because they're often riskier, they also have higher rewards. So uh -huh. you can generally see, like, even the kind of risk-free rate of DeFi stablecoins, the really good, solid, battle-tested ones, still sits like a, maybe a little bit around that risk-free rate. Mm -hmm. But then... You know, if I launch a stablecoin today, people perceive it fairly as fairly risky. Mm -hmm. And you might see 20% yields on that. Oh, okay, okay. Right? And this is actually where TradFi stablecoins can strongly benefit from DeFi stablecoins. Uh -huh. Because there are certain restrictions on centralized stablecoins through the Genius Act offering yield. These asset issuer cannot directly issue yield. Uh -huh. But partners can. Uh -huh. So it makes perfect sense for TradFi stablecoin issuers through the Genius Act to partner with or you know, incentivize liquidity pools with DeFi stablecoins because mm -hmm. you might be able to get access to kind of the like casino that tends to be DeFi. Right, right. And, and some of these DeFi stablecoins might be backed by several different types of uh, digital assets, right? Is that exactly. Fair? So yeah, you can yeah. have a Cardano backed stablecoin, uh -huh. you can have a Solana backed stablecoin. Okay. You know, I'm from the Ethereum ecosystem, so we tend to see a lot of wrapped Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, okay. um, backed stablecoins. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You generally want the asset to be uh, a blue chip asset, uh -huh. like a meme coin backed stable coin is probably going to be risky, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be a little, little, a little crazier. But you can do it, right? Yeah. And <laughs> well, well uh, to it, like what makes that DeFi stable coin resilient? Is it a matter of the selection of the assets that are backing it or is there, are there other factors at play? There's definitely a lot of factors yeah. at play. So you want to look at the assets that are backing it. You want to look at the collateral ratio percent. So generally like there's 90% capital efficiency. Uh -huh. So it might be like if you put in one Ethereum at $4,000, maybe you can only take out $3,800, $3,600 worth of USD. Uh, have a little buffer built in for safety in yeah, case anything yeah, goes wrong. Yeah, that makes sense. So you've been on chain since 2014. What first drew you into the world of crypto? Honestly, it's because all the smartest people in the room <laughs> I found were in this, uh, I was in an accelerator program yeah. the, in Silicon Valley. Yeah. It was a Bitcoin focused accelerator at the time. And yeah. I kind of just fudged the application and said, oh, yeah, we were doing Bitcoin and blockchain. <laughs> just to get it. <laughs> I'm kidding about that. Yeah, like, yeah. There actually was like crypto aspects to it, but I was very much a novice to crypto. Sure, sure. And I was kind of just, you know, I understood the buzzwords, but I didn't understand the technology behind it. Yeah. And then I got in this room with all these other Bitcoin founders who were so smart, like yeah. just intellectually, you know, 10 to 100 IQ points above me because uh -huh, uh -huh. uh, I'm pretty far left curve. Like, pretty <laughs> I don't know about that. But, but they always say you want to be in the room where people are smarter than you. Right. And I was like, okay. So I like read the Satoshi white paper. I like engaged in intellectual debates with people about, you know, it's a very fine line between falling into cryptocurrency and falling in philosophy and economics. Oh, totally. Yeah. And it was kind of a magical time then too, where, you know, you had, I, mean, I came in in 2015 and then, and then it was like in 2016, all of a sudden you saw every kind of like, predatory case from that it's scaled with web 2 now having a kind of a virtuous cycle web 3 <laughs> alternative even if it was just a rough plan or white paper or whatever but mm -hmm. there was something really cool about that I think you know where you see how these things had scaled so rapidly from 2000 to 2015 16 and just nobody really thought of like the knock-on effects of a lot of that at scale and and so it's just kind of a it was a cool time to kind of be around yeah very much so yeah. and I think I wouldn't discount economic opportunity because, right oh absolutely you know there's a lot of people struggling like yeah. I was, I had zero dollars at the time. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, totally, totally. And you take a look at this Wild West and you say, it actually offers like an opportunity for people to scale. And I think maybe times are even tougher for a lot of people now. I agree, um, I agree. there's still amazing opportunities in crypto. Yeah, yeah. How do you feel about that right now? Like what stable coins can do for opening up financial markets for people that might not be served in certain areas of the world or yeah. things like that? Absolutely. This is one of the things that's been like most amazing to me watching since stable coins have had their heyday, especially over the past five years. You know, inflation Inflation in a lot of countries, it makes like almost unlivable. Yeah. Actually, this is, situation has changed a bit since Melee came into power, but in Argentina, right. I got a chance to visit before he came into power, mm -hmm. when they had some of the highest inflation rates in the world. Mm -hmm. And you can't do things like negotiate a contract. You can't, how do you, how do you like, 
get an apartment for a multi-year lease when the currency is going to be going up devalued and your rent's going to have to increase by a significant double digit percent every single yeah, month. Yeah. Yeah. You, how do you hire employees? It, exactly. And I think that stuff's, I mean, you hear about it occasionally, but people in America, et cetera, aren't really exposed to what that type of lifestyle is like and how, exactly. but, it, but you start to look, I mean, if you see how stable coin adoption has kind of the types of transactions and I mean, it's getting adopted everywhere in different ways, right? Mm -hmm. But like you see it where people are actually using it for everyday types of activities in, in parts of the world. It's really cool to kind of see how it changes from place to place. Absolutely. And, you yeah, said yeah. it way better than I could have. I mean, just the adoption of crypto in Argentina and I'm sure many of these other third world nations just greatly outpaced the United States mm -hmm. because it was solving a real world use case. They yeah. got access to a stable currency. Their lives were able to improve dramatically. And, you know, it's basically like U.S. dollar becoming a force for good in a lot of people's lives. Yeah, it's yeah. Awesome. Well, let's switching gears a little bit. Curve has kind of become a cornerstone of the DeFi stablecoin infrastructure. How do you describe its role in the ecosystem? So the tagline that we've been working with is all roads lead to Curve. <laughs> and it works very well because I've noticed that TradFi as well as DeFi stablecoins almost inevitably end up on Curve because you get some of the best access to liquidity throughout the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And then more recently, the ability to have access to the Curve USD and the permissionless Llama Lend lending markets mm -hmm. means that inevitably every stablecoin needs to have a solid Curve strategy if it's going to succeed. Curve's been around for a while, but can you give the audience, some people might not know, what, what does Curve do? Like, how does it, how does it function? Right, so about five years ago, when AMMs were first allowing for permissionless trading, particularly of volatile crypto assets, mm -hmm. Curve founder Michael Egorov had this brilliant idea. It actually came from a use case that he needed. He mm -hmm. needed to be able to exchange large amounts of dollar coins for other dollar coins. Mm -hmm. And the problem is all the algorithms were tailored for trading crypto. Mm -hmm. So you actually expect prices to move very fast. Right. You don't expect stable coins price to move at all if right. you're doing it right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> so if you wanted to trade like hundred dollars for hundred dollars, you know, you get ninety nine dollars out, it's close enough, right? Right, right. If you're trying to trade a million dollars and you're only getting nine hundred thousand dollars out, like that's a significant price movement. Yeah. Uh, so that's referred to as slippage. It was impossible to trade large volumes of stable coins without getting wrecked by slippage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he devised an algorithm which essentially holds that one-to-one -one price for as long as possible. And then at the tail end, it will start to depeg. And as a re that formula works very well. It's the intellectual property of the parent company. Uh -huh. So Curve essentially has like a license for the best stablecoin trading algorithm out there. Nice, nice. And as a result, like it because it's such a fantastic home for stablecoin trading, you'll often see this where stablecoins will put up liquidity on a bunch of different AMMs. Yeah. And then a crisis time will hit and only Curve's AMM is going to be capable of actually handling the severe like DPEGs that have happened for many stable coins throughout yeah. history. And thankfully, a lot of recoveries as well. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So I know we talked about the Genius Act and, and how that's going to change things, but looking ahead to like, what role do you hope that Curve and, and DeFi more broadly will play in reshaping global finance? It's a great question. So I think that we're actually seeing the entire global financial system getting rebuilt in real time. Oh, cool. And we're very lucky to be part of it. Right? Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> you know, it's exciting. Very exciting. Now, I think that we've seen, for example, some of the problems that the traditional finance system has with, you know, they're closed on weekends for starters, which right. is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it is different. I, I Especially the longer you spend in crypto and then you're, you you go back to having to do something in the, the trade price and you're like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> I know. I was like, I think, you know, like my Charles Schwab account's broken. I can't. Right. Um, oh, it's the after hours. Yeah, oh, I forgot. yeah, exactly. <laughs> what is this waiting I have to do? But there's significant problems with international cross-border settlements. Companies eat the cost on all these things. So it's just inevitable that they're all going to migrate to the better technology that is on chain. Mm -hmm. Now for Curve, it's a fantastic time because we're going to see, as I mentioned, thousands, maybe millions of stable coins getting launched and coming on chain because it's a fantastic business. And the Genius Act actually provides like a fantastic structure to allow people to launch stable coins and have like very strong government protections if they launch them through this Genius Act mm -hmm. compliant way. Mm -hmm. At the same time, decentralized stable coins are going to benefit because they are, you know, we mentioned that they're TradFi stablecoins do much better when paired and giving users access to kind of all the amazing innovations being built out in DeFi. Yeah. 
So we're going to see thousands, maybe millions of stable coins coming on chain, bringing significant amounts of liquidity to cryptocurrency mm -hmm. and enabling it to become the new financial rails. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, well, you've also worked in AI since 2008. Absolutely. Um, do you see meaningful crossover between AI and crypto in the present or future? Yeah, I do believe that we're in the early years of the AI era. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's already changed like my life, probably changed your life yeah, significantly. Sure, sure. And we're still in like the earliest innings. Yeah. I, so I don't think it's a stretch to predict that AI is going to change everything about how we interact with the world in the over the course of the next several decades. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I also don't think that we're very good at predicting what that's going to look like. Right, because right. At least so far, like all the AI experts, did any of them call the hallucination problem? No, no. And it's just so much noise and hype too, to where like not a ton of actual market fit with some of these things yet. And, and mm -hmm. I think, you know, a lot of that just comes through people using it more and, and kind of getting, establishing what they want, what they need, what is helpful. Exactly. So, now, yeah. I'm in the camp that uses AI every day. Yeah. I, I mean, I could live without it, but because I have before, but it'd be, <laughs> it's difficult to imagine going back to the pre AI era. Right, right. It does have some like fantastic applications. I don't yet see them as being like I wouldn't trust any of my money uh, right. to an AI agent at this point. Yeah, um, yeah. Partly because of that hallucination problem, right? Yeah. AI agents turned out to be like strongly probabilistic in their construction, right? Yeah. You layer like several layers of neurons, each of which have a probability of firing. It's it turns out it's not surprising that they can issue just like wildly chaotic <laughs> results. Yeah, yeah. But that's not good necessarily for money. Now yeah. it could be though, because you could have a genetic algorithm that says, let's see like different AI agents with a bunch of different strategies and right. evolve the one that wins the fastest. And maybe you, like it might actually work. Yeah, um, yeah. But that being said, I'm certain that the way that you can handicap it is that because of this kind of phenomenon where AI is like able to kind of like imagine all the crazy superposition of possibilities, that AI is digital abundance and crypto is digital scarcity. Yeah. So it's almost certain that the two of them are going to find like amazing overlaps as the decades play out. What excites or concerns you about how AI and crypto might intersect in the coming years? I know you mentioned hallucinations, right? <laughs> is there, are there anything else that comes to mind? Well, I don't think hallucinations is necessarily a problem. Okay, you just good. have to figure out how to like use it within crypto. Uh -huh. um, and I think that there is like strong advantages to how it can already be used within the crypto space. Already at the moment, blockchains generate more data than humans can interpret. Right, right, right. Um, but AIs are actually very good at interpreting that data. Mm -hmm. Of course, you need to kind of then feed it back into other algorithms to say, all right, did the AI actually interpret this correctly or to just imagine that there's an arbitrage opportunity here? Sure. But it might become very good at like, and already is actually very good at finding potential solutions for complex like MEV problems, uh -huh, for example. Uh -huh. So it already has some applications. Or like searching governance forums because there's a ton of like right. crazy yeah. information that they thousands of and it like stacks over years right <laughs> and, exactly it's, and it can be very tough to understand what's going on so it's already got some applications the only thing that concerns me is that and this is not necessarily a problem with ai just a problem with crypto in general yeah. is i get so sad when i see hacks or people just losing money because yeah. they got too greedy yeah and i think that ai is going to give people like a toolkit to get themselves hurt yeah 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 or people giving too many liberties to ai tools or functionality exactly. when it comes to money and not enough safeguards or something exactly like they won't understand it so they're going to find ways to like gamble on a meme coin they shouldn't have or <laughs> they're going to get fished and lose their private keys yeah yeah uh, or it could be a tool for hackers honestly to right. say you know here's a set of smart contracts like see if you can find an exploit. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Five of the, it'll come back with 10 results, five will be hallucinations, five will be real, and people get their money drained faster. So, yeah, yeah. So all the problems with crypto will get exacerbated, and yeah. that is going to be painful, because sure. just watching the hacks like hurts on this emotional and visceral level. It does, level. it does. <laughs> um, but then I think it'll also enhance all the amazing things about cryptocurrency as well. In the same way that like the hacks and the problems will get enhanced, I think we're going to see like a proliferation of new innovations that would not have been possible without AI. Absolutely, absolutely. So, well, Overall bullish. Yeah, totally. I mean, we covered a lot too, and I really appreciate you coming on, sharing with us on, and with the audience on this. Is there anything we didn't cover that you think our audience might want to hear about? Oh, I'm sure days worth of stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> Any one thing that came to mind. No, if not, no, no worries. No, no, I really, Garrett, really appreciate you, you coming on, sharing this with our audience. It's a super informative conversation. I'd love to have you back too, just as things progress and check back in on this. Anytime. You know where to find me. I'm in my Brave browser all day. All right. Appreciate it, man. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Brave Technologist podcast. To never miss an episode, make sure you hit follow in your podcast app. If you haven't already made the switch to the Brave browser, you can download it for free today at brave.com and start using Brave Search, which enables you to search the web privately. 
Brave also shields you from the ads, trackers, and other creepy stuff following you across the web. 